Hey there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. The weather's icky yet again today. I tried to change my filming location so it was closer to the window, but I just couldn't make it work. It required almost getting underneath my desk. <laughs> like really squishing myself in there so that I would be at a good angle to the window and you know so I will try and make this lighter and brighter in post-processing because that's what post-processing is for. We are coming up on August which is Women in Translation Month. This is an initiative started by Mital Rosinski on the blogosphere and it's been running for a few years now and it has gotten bigger and bigger every year. The idea is that you read women writers in translation rather simple. There's a statistic flying around that only 3% of books in the English market are translated and women are not translated on parody with men. I forget if it's like a quarter of those are written by women. So Rosinski started Women in Translation Month to help get more visibility to these awesome women writers and to help encourage people not only to read them but for publishers to publish more. I've been doing this for years on my blog. I will link those posts down below and I love it. I always meet writers that I'd never heard of, travel to cultures that I know nothing about, and learn so much and have so much fun. So in that spirit, I have some quick recommendations here for you today of books that you can read for Women in Translation Month. And don't feel that you have to read only Women in Translation for the entire month. I never do that. I make it more of a priority in my reading. When I need a new book to pick up, I try to reach one. That's a woman in translation. But there's no reason that you can't fit it into your reading schedule, however it fits. About half of these books are ones that I've read more recently and that I've talked about, and half of them are ones that I read before I started my channel and I've yet to tell you about, so let's get right into it. First is Night School, A Reader for Grown Ups by Sophia Ban, translated by Jim Tucker. I love the idea behind this book in that it's a reader for grown ups, like it says in the title. They are short stories that while the content of them is not necessarily linked, they are thematically linked by the whole concept. They will be headed with different subjects like economics or home ec or physical education or interesting combinations of the two. And at the end of each story are some like questions like you would find in a textbook, but they're unusual and I still remember some of them even though I read this months ago. The one that I remember off the top of my head is how many angels can you fit on the head of a pin if each one is 2.5 millimeters and soulless? Something like that. It sounds really weird by itself, but it works at the end of each story. And the stories themselves often call back to something in real life. There's one that is based on Sir Isaac Newton. There's one that's based on uh, dangerous liaisons. And it both uses that and completely goes away from that. They're a little absurd in a way I like. I like my short stories to be odd and this definitely fits that. The writing is beautiful. I would just let it carry me along and it helps to go with the absurdity than to fight it and the author takes you to all these interesting places and I would read this on the train and every once in a while I would just kind of look up into the middle distance and think about the image that was presented for me. There are all these connections to draw that made my mind like were in a really fun way. And I can't say that I got every story. For example, I haven't seen Dangerous Liaisons, so I think a lot of that went over my head, but I enjoyed it all the same. Next is one of my all-time favorite works of translated nonfiction. It's a simple story, The Last Malambo by Lila Guerrero, translated by Francis Riddle. The Malambo is a traditional Argentinian dance and there are competitions for it. There are women sections, but most of it concentrates on the men, and there are guys that will uh, practice and train so hard for years in order to do this dance. And I'll leave a link down below to my review of it because if you connect her description of the dance with an actual video of the dance, it just shows, first of all, how wonderful her writing is and how kinetic and powerful and kind of frantic this dance is. It's incredibly physically demanding. It has a particular number of steps. Everything is repeated on both feet. It's completely symmetrical and it gets faster and faster and faster as you watch it. Even when it begins, you think this is a decently fast dance and then it just goes. All of this training is to win a competition. It's every year and no one really knows about it unless you do Malambo. 
but it's extremely prestigious and the prize is never being able to dance it again. Guerrero follows dancers, finds out what makes them tick, what is the point of winning a competition that means you can never do this thing you love again, and it's extremely interesting. It's not all that thick and it just, oh, it's one of those books that I rationed out to myself. I loved it so much I wanted it to last. From Europe to South America and now to Africa, we have The First Wife by Paulina Chiziane. She translated by David Brookshaw. She is the first published female novelist from Mozambique. So polygamy happens in Mozambique and in the story, Rami, who has been married to her husband for 20 years, finds out that he has been supporting another wife and a whole nother family. And as she gets with her and starts interacting, she finds out that actually her husband has four other wives and four other families that he is supporting. And they make him, they grew up together, they make him do the honorable thing and marry each one of the women and they all seek to get what they deserve. It's feminist, it's funny, which sounds weird because it's kind of a topic that could get really heavy, but there's always this lightness to it. And I learned so much about Mozambique and the influence of Christianity and the Portuguese and all of this stuff. It was a great encapsulation of that that gave me a window into their society. Next is a book that I read in Japanese but was published in English kind of recently and it's Konbini Ningen or Convenience Store Woman by Murata Sayaka translated by Gini Tapli Takemori. Keiko is 36 and she has not led a conventional life by Japanese standards. One is expected to follow the track of graduating from high school, graduating from college, immediately getting into a good job, getting married, having kids, and any deviation from this is seen with skepticism and not taken very well by your friends and family. And Keiko went immediately from high school to working at a convenience store, which is usually part-time job, doesn't really have any prospects, especially if you don't become a manager, and seen as kind of a dead end, and she stayed there for 18 years. She's now 36, and this book talks about why the job is perfect for her, why it fits something that she needs in her personality, a lot of the pressure that she's getting from the outside, and a guy that she meets, and all this stuff happens. I loved reading this in Japanese. I've heard great things about the English translation, but one thing I will say is that you will probably benefit, if you read several languages, to read it in whatever your fastest language is, because there's a toxic dude in here, and because I was reading at a slower speed in Japanese, I felt like I was marinating in that toxicness, and all the vocabulary words I was learning were related to his awful behavior. Ooh. It's a great book to blast through quickly. It's not all that long. You can do it in two or three sittings, and that's exactly what I recommend. Next is another wonderful nonfiction book in translation. It's Farm in the Green Mountains by Alice Hurden Zuckmeyer, translated by Ida Washington and Carol Washington. Hurden Zuckmeyer's husband was a playwright in Germany as the Nazis were coming into power, and he wrote a satire about the Nazis and that did not go over very well and they had to flee and they went to I think Switzerland first and they eventually came to the United States. They originally tried out Los Angeles, didn't like it, New York, didn't care for it, and by chance ended up in the middle of nowhere in Vermont and fell in love. They ended up staying there for five years which was quite a change because they were used to having servants living in a townhouse and here they had to make do for themselves. They kept chickens and ducks and tried to keep the chickens and the ducks from killing each other and there's whole bunches of fun stuff going on here. In addition to all of the fun, there's some conversations about, because they're refugees, and what it means to be a German in America in the 1940s and how that went, uh, how they felt about their new home of a country, and for them it felt like more of a home than Germany ever did. And the whole exploration of that as an American made me all warm and fuzzy, and it's simply wonderful. I highly recommend that you guys read this. I'd love to hear what you think if you do. It's just, oh, it's so good. And last, we have another feel-good book. It's a manga. It's done in full color, too. It's Cheese Sweet Home by Konami Kanata, and I don't have the translator name. I don't remember if it's available. If it is, I'll pop it up right here. It's the story of a kitten that gets separated from his mother and adopted by a Japanese family in an apartment where technically they're not supposed to have cats, but they can't resist. It's so cute and obviously in need of some care. And it's all of the cat stuff that if you've had cats, if you like cats, it's all of that cute, wonderful stuff and slight annoyances and it's all just there on the page and it's just so cute. 
To give you a quick example of what some of the stories are like, uh, the father takes Chi to the vet for the very first time, Chi is traumatized, and the father and put not happy with the father figure, and uh, the father tries to buy back Chi's love with toys. It's just cute like that. There's not all that much text, it reads quickly, but you can still go slowly and enjoy the art. And if you're a cat person, it's a really easy pick. So there we have it, my recommendations for Women in Translation Month. I hope that you'll join in. And I'm currently putting together my own pile of possibilities, but I am low on nonfiction choices, and I love nonfiction in translation. So if you know of any books that you can recommend, please let me know down in the comments below, as well as if you've read any of these books or what you're planning to do for Women in Translation Month yourself. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.